welcome to three, two, one. Let's have we have sprint off. Uh, we are lucky to have Angie and uh, Talia joining us today. Um, this session is sponsored by Agile Alliance. So thanks to them. Thank you a lot. Without further ado, let me hand it over to you, Angie and Talia. Take it over. Thanks so much, Deep. Welcome, everybody, to our session this morning. We're really excited to be doing this. This is our first time doing it virtually. So uh, we've run this, this particular uh, workshop format at quite a couple of conferences in the past. But like I said, this is the first time we're doing it virtually. And you're the first group that's actually going to experience being able to do many of these, te these techniques in a virtual way. So we're really excited. Um, so I'm just going to kind of in, jump off and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Angie Doyle. I'm an Agile coach and trainer with a company called Think Agile in South Africa. Um, Talia, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Angie. My name is Talia Lancaster. I'm an Agile coach which are with a large bank in South Africa called ABSA. Um, and I also have a company that I own called The Sketching Scrum Master, where I do graphic recording. Okay, should I get the slides up? I think so. And in the meantime, while Tully is getting the slides up, I want to ask a question to everybody in the audience. And you can interact with us on the little discuss uh, button on the right-hand side of the panel. Um, I want to know how many of you have heard of high-performance teams. If you've heard of high-performance teams, just put a yes or a why under the dis into the discuss under chat. So I'll also go and... I don't know why, right? There are lots of people have heard of high performance teams. Great. Awesome. And for those of you who've heard of high performance teams, or maybe you've been lucky enough to be part of a high performance team, uh, we want you to just put in the chat what are the behaviors or values that you've seen in the teams? So if you could type us a little um, example of some of the behaviors that have been evident in a high performance team. And you can just use one or two words. And, you know, high performance teams could be any teams that you've worked on. They don't necessarily need to be agile teams that you've been in. They could be maybe if you were in the army, maybe they were a high school sports team. And um, we're really looking for any kind of high performance team that you've been part of, some of the characteristics. So I'm seeing things like self-organized, there's commitment, there's ownership, there's empathy for each other, self-driven, driving ownership. Those are all really amazing kind of sounding words. Um, ownership, accountability, things like collaboration, right? So high levels of trust, high levels of respect for each other as well, uh, typically tend to be some of the characteristics that we see. Now, interestingly enough, not everybody has been in high performance teams, right? So, um, and we're going to, you know, pretty much what this session is going to take you through is how do we get to this point of being high performance a lot quicker? Awesome. So let's look at some of the, the traits of high performance teams. Um, so there was a project done by Google called the Aristotle Project, um, and it comes from that quote by Aristotle, which is, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And basically, Google kind of, uh, they're very good with data. So they went and they analyzed hundreds of teams to try and understand what that formula is for a high performance team. Um, and they were looking for things like, how many people do we have in a team? Or what is a team kind of structure in terms of uh, the makeup of the team or the skills? And what they found was there were actually five common traits. There was never any kind of common uh, sizes, et cetera, but there were five common traits that were all evident in high performance teams. Um, and these are number one is psychological safety. So if you make a mistake in your team, it's not held against you. Um, so you feel that you're safe to kind of give input, brainstorm, um, and give your ideas um, and be vulnerable without kind of... Uh, someone holding it against you within the team. Uh, the second one is dependability. Um, so if your teammates say that they're going to do something, do they actually follow through with it? Uh, the third thing is structure and clarity. So are there clear roles within the teams? Are there clear plans and goals that the team are all aligned to? Uh, the fourth one is meaning. Um, and this is very much, you know, do I personally find meaning in the team that I'm part of? And lastly is impact. So do I understand how my team contributes to the greater organizational goal? How do we as a team impact our 
the organization and add value. So what we realized um, after working with some teams is that these, um, you know, these are traits of these high performance teams. And um, we realized that high performance spaces don't happen by accident, right? So you actually really need to have um, a very intentional approach to creating high performance teams. And something that Talia and I started doing many years ago is we started running workshops with teams, kind of similar to a liftoff, where we would create their team charter, okay? So what we realized is it's really important for high performance teams to kind of consciously create the space um, where they, they work together, they collaborate. This kind of thing doesn't happen by accident, right? So you have to have a very conscious approach to creating teams. And this isn't just about creating like a project charter, right? This is actually about creating a team charter. So the way that we make the distinction between an agile charter or an agile kind of charter in general and a team charter is that your agile charter usually includes that product side as well, right? So a little bit more of a focus on the product development side. So when we're trying to get to high performance, understanding what you're building is really important, but we want to focus on the team side first, okay? So how, how we actually did this is we started looking for ways to help teams kind of get an understanding of everything that they, you know, that they need to get to to create this high performance team space. And we stumbled across something called the team canvas. Okay. And I want to share an image with you of what um, a, a team canvas looks like. And I wish we could claim ownership. Um, of the team canvas. Unfortunately, it's not something uh, that we created. This is actually something that other people created. What you can see in front of you is the team canvas. And that is essentially um, this canvas that we started working with. And we realized that all of those different segments that you go through are the types of things that high performance teams really need to work on to create these high performance team environments. Um, and what we did is we used it as inspiration um, to identify a whole bunch of techniques. We're actually going to take you through those techniques today. We do have a booklet and we will give you that link at the end of the session. We've got a booklet that you're welcome to download. It actually gives you more techniques than what we're showing today. Um, and it really just gives you an idea of how to run these the booklets, very focused on in-person ones. Um, and we're going to we're going to talk today about how we do in-person as well as virtual uh, exercises. And you're going to have an opportunity a little bit later to actually practice some of the virtual ones. Like I said, you're going to be the first group that we have. Okay. Are we ready to move on to purpose, Angie? I think. So Talia is going to start as kick us off with the thing that we always start off with, right? So we don't have a specific order that we follow on the canvas. Um, but the one rule that we do have is we always start at the heart of the canvas, which is the purpose, which is where Talia is going to take us to now. Awesome. So as Angie said, the purpose is right at the center of the canvas. And it's actually a little, a little heart, which is quite fitting. Um, and this purpose speaks to what are we do as a team okay so why are we doing what we're doing and what is our reason for existing um, and this is quite different from a product purpose in that it's very much about the team so for this um, exercise we're not looking necessarily at product features um, and kind of details we're not building a backlog it's very much about connecting people with the purpose um, of that particular team um, and going back to kind of high performance team what is that meaning that people can derive from being part of the team? Um, so Angie and I have various techniques that we like to use here. A quick and easy one is maybe taking video clips of your actual customer um, and playing that in things like your sprint planning or your PI planning um, to really kind of connect with your customer and make sure that you don't lose touch as a team with who you're actually developing for. Um, another technique that, that you actually have an opportunity to do today um, is called the Elevator Pitch Storyboard. Um, and this is very much, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with kind of creating videos or uh, in the production industry where you would actually have a, a storyboard of um, what, what story you're going to tell. Um, and what we do here is we actually encourage teams to use both visuals and words to connect with their purpose. Um, and it basically falls into three steps. So step one is 
What is the problem statement? So really connecting with kind of what problem are we trying to solve for the customer? Step two is what are our unique skills as a team that we can actually use to, to address this problem? And step three is how do we ultimate, ultimately make the world a better place? And that very much speaks to the value. Um, so the best way to kind of illustrate the storyboard is to go through an example. Um, and this example we drew uh, by hand, uh, actually on an iPad, so you could do that virtually if you have access to that. Um, if you are in a virtual setting, you can actually just use icons from Google or as a scrum master, you could kind of set up some icon packs for the team and you can drag and drop icons into the image space instead of drawing it. Um, so this translates really well to, to virtual as well for the teams. So basically uh, with this example, you can see for step one, um, you've got a very unhappy uh, looking customer. You've got quite a, a horrible looking house uh, with a, a big price tag on it. I suppose it depends on the currency, uh, which is 3000 per person. Um, and basically the customer looks very, very unhappy in that, in that step one, which is your problem statement. Uh, once you've illustrated the problem, you would then write it in words. Um, and the way that you phrase it is like a question. Do you know how? Um, and so this example is, do you know how people travel to a foreign country or city and don't always know what kind of accommodation they are getting for the money they are spending? Um, I think that this is a bit foreign to us at the moment because <laughs> we're not really traveling. <laughs> but remember when we used to travel, um, and Angie and I are very sad that we're not in India this year, but yeah. anyway. Okay, so that's a problem statement. Um, and then you actually start step two with writing first. So you would say, for example, what we do is match people looking for accommodation with people who have, spa who have spare accommodation that they are willing to share at a reduced cost. Okay, and then we illustrate that. So now we see a person who looks a bit happier um, and we're connecting them with a vacant house. Um, and that's basically the unique skills and how the team is addressing that problem. And then lastly, this one, we start again with the picture first, um, and that's how do we make the world a better place? So ultimately the value here, you can see a very happy customer with a heart, the house is filled because the lights are on and there's money coming out of the chimney. Um, and the statement here for the ultimate value is so that travelers can save money when they travel, hosters can make money by, um, by renting their space, their spare space, and everyone feels safe and secure during this process. Okay, so can anyone guess in the discuss uh, section, can anyone guess what company this is? To type it into the chat. Just type it into the is. chat if you think you know. Airbnb. Yeah. Okay, or something Maybe along those lines. I'm not sure what else you guys have um, in India. We've got a couple of different types of, of companies that do this sort of thing in South Africa. Awesome. Um, and basically, by the end of it, you have one page that the team hopefully really connects with in terms of the purpose and the meaning um, of that team and, and what value they're actually delivering for the customer. Okay. And they can pitch their purpose to other people, right, using this uh, storyboard as a template for them to have a conversation. Okay. So now that we have a good idea of what we're doing and why we exist as a team, we want to move into understanding a little bit more about people and roles, right? So who, who's on the team? What are their responsibilities? Um, and what we've realized is that people make a lot of assumptions um, about people in their team based on um, the roles that they used to have in more of a waterfall type environment, right? So what we do is we actually take them through an exercise where we unpack the roles in the team and then we say, well, what are people expecting from this role that used to exist, this business analyst, this tester, you know, maybe a back-end developer, front-end developer, et cetera. And what we, what we do is we, we have two different types of exercises that we run, one for new teams and one for um, existing teams. This isn't a version that we've actually currently uh, converted into an electronic format. Um, we're in the process of kind of converting all of our exercises. It's just this one that we haven't quite got to. But we have got this as a principal version. 
And essentially what we call it is we call it 101 responsibilities. It's really ideal for like a web-based team, but you can modify the content to be more suitable for an application development team as well. So what we do is we have 101 cards. It's basically a pack of cards that we cut out and each of them has a different responsibility on it. And this exercise was inspired by, um, you know, very often in scrum teams will say, what's a role in a scrum team, right? But, it, you know, it kind of goes into the product owner role and the scrum master role, but it doesn't talk about what are the technical requirements or the technical tasks that we actually have to do um, for this team. So we've got a list of everything, of everything that we believe they do. So you can see two examples there, automate deployment scripts and then create the product roadmap. And what we do is we paste upon the wall um, a, kind of all the roles that we have in the team. So here we've got business analyst, front-end developer, product owner, scrum master. Really, you just kind of identify what are the roles that people are associated with in the organization, right? Because most of us haven't moved into this concept of just being kind of like a product development team member or development um, team member. And we put this pack of cards, 101 responsibilities, face down on a table and we do it as a silent exercise. And people walk up to the card, they pick up a card and they then read it silently and they go and they put it on uh, to the, the corresponding role that they see up on the wall. So they'll go and they'll stick it somewhere. Um, so that's one move that they can make. Another move that they can make is if there's already cards up on different roles, they might decide to move one particular responsibility, maybe from a product owner to a business analyst, or they can pass, right? So if, they're, if they don't want to move anything that's currently up on the posters or they're not too sure what the card in front of them says, they can say, I'm going to pass, and then the next person walks up and places the card. So it's the three moves. Either they can um, assign that particular responsibility to one of the roles that they see, um, or they can move a card that's already been placed under a role to a different role, or they can pass. Now, the key thing with this is we ask our Scrum Masters or our team facilitators to just track how many cards are moving from one role to another role. So whenever they move a role, um, we ask them to just put a little dot in it, right? And it just starts to indicate that a bit of a silent battle is happening. Because remember, this whole exercise we're doing silently, we're not actually talking about it. So we want to identify if people are, are like waging a war of worlds across these different cards, right? So every time a card's moved, um, the Scrum Master will put a little dot on it. And the second there's three dots on it, um, the Scrum Master basically takes it out of play. Okay, And that's just an indication that there's a silent argument happening. We probably need to have a discussion about this. It's not going to be resolved by us just like aggressively moving cards from one role to another role. And then what we do at the end of the exercise is all of, all of the roles and responsibilities would have been um, allocated to a particular role. And uh, we then have a conversation, right? So if I'm a business analyst, I'll go to the business analyst poster and I'll have a look at all the roles that were allocated to that particular or all the responsibilities allocated to that role. And I'll start saying, yes, I agree with this. Actually, I've got a question about this. I disagree with this one. This actually goes to a different type of role. And really the key behind this is we're not trying to allocate things for people to do, right? So we're not saying a business analyst only does this and a tester only does this. But we know coming into teams that there's an assumption that certain people are going to have deeper skills in some things than other people do, right? So we want to get a sense of what's the first thing of somebody with those deep business analysis skills are going to pick up in the team? What is What are the types of responsibilities or tasks that someone with deep test analyst skills is going to pick up? And this is really just kicking off that conversation, right? So it's just about helping people explore who's going to kind of not own, but who's going to accept responsibility for certain things in the sprint and um, before they pick up something else, right? So already we're starting to get a sense of maybe where some of our skills are deeper in certain types of things than other things. We're going to take you through another exercise in skills just now. So this is that's the one that we do for existing teams uh, or new teams. This is the one that we do for um, existing teams, okay? And what we do is we use that same concept of we putting up the posters, and um, you can see we've got the virtual version on the left-hand side in Google Docs, where we just put in the title. And then what people do is they just type in what they believe that type of role, the kinds of tasks, the kinds of responsibilities that they'd have in a sprint. They type it in, or if it's physical, they'd write it up on a board. And then we go through a similar kind of format where the person who believes that they're most aligned to that role, so, you 
you know, my title in the organization might be business analyst. I'll go up to that poster and what I'll do is I'll tick the ones that I agree with. If it's virtual, I'll just make it in green. Um, if I've got a question, I might put a question mark to it next to it. Um, if it's virtual, we'll just maybe put it in something like orange. Um, and if I disagree with something um, in the virtual one, I'm going to put like a cross next to it. Um, you know, on, on a physical post, I'll put a cross next to it. In the virtual space, I might highlight it and read. And the ones that we want to talk about are the ones where there's questions and the ones that we disagree with. And those are going to be the responsibilities for that role that we're going to take a little bit deeper and have a conversation within the team. Awesome. So now that we've defined the roles within the team, uh, we want to take it a level deeper and speak about skills. So Angie mentioned, you know, in an ideal agile world, we wouldn't necessarily have these um, titles or, or roles. Um, you know, we'd have a development team. Um, however, when that happens, we need to have a very strong grasp on the skills um, the strengths and the weaknesses within the team. Um, so the next part in the canvas we've actually combined together. It's two sections, which speaks to strengths and assets, and then the second section, which is weaknesses and risks. And this is basically what skills do we have in the team um, and what are our individual and team weaknesses? Sorry, my bunny's making a bit of noise in the background. <laughs> He's biting something. Okay, so, so with this section, basically, um, what you want to do is get a, an understanding of what the skills are within the team. Um, and this includes soft skills um, and your technical skills. Um, and essentially, what you want out of this is to identify, um, obviously, where the strengths are, uh, if you see that you have a lot of skill in a particular area, um, and then potentially where the weaknesses are. Um, and the true value with an exercise like this is to actually come up with a plan um, to ensure that you're addressing and, and filling those gaps from a skill perspective. Um, so Angie and I have developed a, a technique, um, and it's similar to Management 3.0 has a really great one with a grid. Um, we've decided to, to make it into a pizza because we thought it was really fun. Um, and it depends how hungry you are. We've got eight slices here. You could, you could have more slices if you want. Um, but basically what we do here is we actually overlay various um, elements of information. Um, so on the pizza, in the crust, you would put your skill. Um, so you can pick your top eight skills. And the trick here is to understand what skills you need for that particular team. Um, so if you're a web-based team, you may have very different skills to if you kind of doing .NET development um, or even, you know, teams nowadays that aren't just software development teams, you may be a marketing team and then your skills pizza is going to look very different. So you want to identify your top eight skills um, that are imperative to delivering the product um, in that team. Um, and the way we do this is we actually brainstorm on stickies. Um, everyone can kind of put in the skills that they believe are core to the team you theme it and come up with your top eight skills. Um, those then go into the crust of the pizza. So you can see this is the virtual version. So we've got the sticky notes where we've brainstormed, themed it and agreed on our top eight, and then just pulled them across onto the crust of the pizza. The next step then is to actually identify the people within the team. So you can see on the right-hand side, we've got a team key. Um, I'm the tomato here, Angie's the avo, and then we've got Egbert, we've got Al, we've got Shadi. So each of the individuals in the team will then pick up an avatar that correlates to their name, and they'll map out on the pizza where their competency level is for that particular skill. Um, so for example, Angie's a pro in business analysis. Um, you can see that she's sitting in the green uh, section for business analysis. The orange section speaks to intermediate, the red section speaks to newbie, and then one element that Angie and I have added in right in the center is I want to learn. So sometimes within a team there is someone who doesn't necessarily have deep skill set in a particular skill, but they're really interested in, in learning and growing their skill set. Um, so everyone, after you've mapped your avatars onto the pizza, 
Um, and essentially, we need to trust people within the team to be to be honest here. What does help when you when you're running this with a team is actually to define what you mean by these different categories. So within particular teams, for a pro, you might say, well, we expect a pro to have at least five years experience, plus they need to present at conferences and be thought experts, or they need to, you know, so what are the different uh, criteria within the team for each of these categories um, or each of these levels of competency? So once everyone's mapped their avatar on the pizza, the next step that we want to do is at the bottom on the right, you'll see there's a sad face, which is I can do it, but I don't like it. Um, and this is really important with teams because often we rely on people who are experts in a skill and that's what they do day in and day out, but they actually hate it. They really don't enjoy doing that particular, particular thing. So what we want to do is actually identify where people don't enjoy doing something because that is, is potentially a risk for the team. If they're the only person who can do that thing and they don't enjoy it, we could actually lose them and they could leave our team. Um, so we overlay the sad faces where it's relevant for, for the different people and the different skills. And then lastly, what we do together as a team is we identify using the red exclamation points, we identify where the potential risks are. So if you see in our example um, for Java as a skill set, which we've identified as a, a core skill that's required for this team, we've only got Shadi, who's a newbie in Java, and we've got Egbert, who wants to learn, but currently doesn't really have a lot of skill set in Java. So that's a massive risk for the team. Um, you know, and if that's something that we need in order to deliver this product, then we need to make a plan quite quickly to, to address that gap. So once we have this view and we've identified any kind of risks or gaps for the team, the final step for this is actually to come up with a skills action plan. And this is really important because I think often we, we do this exercise where we identify skills, but we don't kind of take it a step further to say, what are we going to do about um, upskilling or growing skills or filling these particular gaps? So what we recommend here is to have a plan that's very specific. So you put what do you want to do, who's owning that action, and when should it be completed by. So for example, here we have go on additional Python training, um, Egbert is going to own that, and he should have completed this by the end of next month. Okay, so that's the skills. So Talia um, had kind of touched on uh, that little unhappy face that we have on our skills pizza, um, where people don't necessarily enjoy doing something. And so often we don't pay attention to people's needs in a team, right? And, you know, our needs need to be fulfilled for us to be happy at work every day. I mean, we, we're spending um, all of our time with people in our team. We want to let them into a little bit about how we tick and what's really important to us. And how we do that um, with teams is we address their needs and expectations and we have a very open, transparent conversation about it. Um, we don't usually do this as part of our initial kickoff with teams. I spoke briefly about that team charter. Um, you know, we, we don't do this right at the beginning when a team's forming. Um, we tend to let the team build up a little bit of higher levels of psychological safety so that they feel comfortable about actually letting people into, you know, usually what we kind of protect other people from seeing, right? Like who we are, what makes us tick. Um, and the way that we do this is we've created a fun game um, that basically identifies different needs within the team, right? So, um, Talia, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so those little cards on the left-hand side, we've created 10 of them. We sourced our list of needs uh, from the Center for Nonviolent Communication, from their list of needs. Um, we just identified the top 10 that we saw kind of consistently came out of the teams that we were working with. But if we haven't covered all of the needs for people in a team, we sometimes give them the opportunity to identify, you know, using this big list. 
Um, but I'll, I'll show you what our technique kind of looks like. So everybody lands up with 10 cards. So this one works well as a virtual exercise and well as a physical one. So if it's a physical exercise, we print out the need cards and we give everybody their own pack. Um, if it's virtual, we give them all 10 cards on something like a Google slide and they can move things around. We ask them to prioritize these different needs in order of priority, right? So specifically, we're looking for those top five ones from a virtual perspective. But, you know, usually we're working with the top three to five, basically. So you can see I've got an example of myself over here. I've got creativity as being my top need. And that's really important for me to fulfill on a daily basis. And I find that if I'm not able to be creative and I'm not able to express myself creatively in teams, I tend to get quite frustrated, right? So it's an important thing for me to be able to do um, you know, in the teams that I work with. So for that particular need of creativity, I, I basically complete something that we call the needs card. Um, this was pretty much inspired by user stories. You can see the format looks like a user story, right? So, you know, as Angie, so you just put your name as a team member in there. You say, I need, and I kind of indicate, I need the space to be creative. Okay, but what does that mean? What do I need from other people in the team to help me be creative? And here I've basically said, so a request from the team, the opportunity to include visual elements in our requirement discussions. Okay, so I'm, I'm going in with something that's quite hard to kind of put your finger on and needs quite intangible, but I'm making it a specific request from the team. That's something that they can do. If I just threw out and I said I need to be creative, I haven't given them any kind of um, insight into what it means for me to be able to be creative. So we make a very explicit request from the team. Um, and if we're in a team that really cares about each other, those high levels of collaboration and respect that we were talking about, they're going to try their best to create a space that everybody wants to work in, right? One where creativity is valued for Angie. Um, and then you can see there's a little post-it over there. So usually how we run the exercise is more as a silent exercise. So again, we'll prioritize our needs cards um, and or, or our, our all you need is are what those little cards are called. So we'll prioritize those. We'll then write the needs cards. And we usually do that silently because that's all the information that we have in our own heads, right? Um, once we've done our, need, our needs cards, we invite other people in the team to have a look at what we've written down, specifically what we're requesting from the team. We ask them if anything's maybe not very clear. So do they need clarity on anything that's written on our needs card? And then what they do is they might put some post-it notes or add some notes just where they need some idea of what you mean about something. So Hopefully, they're not questioning the need, right? That's the kind of behavior we wouldn't want to really see in this exercise because people are opening themselves up. They've been quite vulnerable with this. Um, hopefully, what they're doing with those questions is saying, I just need a little bit more clarity about what you're asking of me as a team member. So you can see here, the little note says, does this include visuals in other events like retrospectives? And that would be a trigger for a conversation um, with me and the rest of the team to say, yes, I'd love to be able to include some visual elements into our retrospectives. Okay. And we could talk about how we could possibly do that. So like we said, this one is quite a, it, it requires people to be quite vulnerable. So we don't dive into this with brand new teams. We kind of let them work together for a little bit and build up trust before uh, before we, we run this. Awesome. Thanks, Angie. And that needs exercise is very powerful. So whenever we run it with teams, it's really um, powerful. But as Angie said, you need a lot of uh, trust within the team. Um, so needs are quite personal. No one else can really fulfill your need for you. You know, you can express what, what your need is. Um, but it's not necessarily a shared thing. It's a very personal thing. Um, whereas the next section in the in the canvas is very much shared team values. Um, and that speaks to, you know, what do we really stand for and believe in? And how are we going to show it? So often with companies, I don't know how many of you, you can maybe give a thumbs up if you resonate with this. But often with companies, you'll have like a really nice poster or Maybe in the lobby, you'll have like your top kind of values for the company. Um, and often it's things like respect or integrity or, um, I don't know, ownership or, you know, so they're always these kind of uh, company-wide values. What Angie and I find with teams is that you need to take it a level 
lower in order to identify the specific behaviors that you're expecting within a team. Um, so although values are really powerful and it's important to identify your team values, you need to agree on what those daily behaviors are. And that helps you hold each other accountable um, and just agree on kind of what do those values mean for you. Um, so quite an interesting example that, that I experienced with a team here in South Africa is um, we did the values exercise and one of the team values that they identified was respect. Um, and in South Africa, we've got lots of different cultures um, and these cultures differ quite quite drastically in terms of things like how do you show respect for other people? How do you show respect for people older than you or people in your um, organization? And um, one of the, the team members had written that she shows respect by looking at people in the eye, um, so making eye contact with people. Um, and the team, another team member actually said it's the absolute opposite for him and his culture. So in his culture, to look someone in the eye is a form of disrespect. Um, and from that, actually, they had worked in a team previously together, and um, she always thought that this team member didn't like her because he never used to look at her. Um, and they kind of resolved this whole misunderstanding just by kind of being very explicit about the behaviors that they're wanting to see in the team. Um, and then at least you have an opportunity to agree on you know, so I think the resolution with that was, you know, if it's part of your culture to not look in the eye, then please don't. I now understand where that's coming from. Um, and I understand it's a form of respect. So what we do for this activity is um, the two kind of uh, options here. So if you're doing this physically um, in a room together, there is a, a big values list that's available on management 3.0. Um, it's a lot of values. It's, I think Angie and I tried to count it once. It's about 200. <laughs> um, so what we would do if you're physically in a room is print one of these out for each person. Um, and then you kind of physically make five dots next to your top five values. What Angie and I have done from a virtual perspective if we, is we've shortlisted the values um, onto a slide just to make it easier. And each person has five um, dot votes to vote on their, their top values. What you can do if you pressed for time with this activity is if you're a scrum team, you could actually just use the scrum values, um, especially if that's something that you're wanting to kind of embed and, and encourage within the team. Uh, you can automatically kind of identify things like focus or openness or courage, commitment, etc. Okay, so once you've uh, shortlisted your values, you want to have no more than five. So usually three to five values is a kind of um, happy place. Um, you don't want too many values because then it's, it's kind of too much to, to focus on for the team. So again, we've included an example here of the physical poster. Um, and it ends up being quite pretty, like a, like a flower with all the behaviors radiating out and the values in the center. Um, and what it says there is atmosphere. Um, and the reason for that is your team values are something that kind of hang around in the air like a perfume. So they're sometimes quite difficult to put your finger on in terms of what exactly those values are. But when you're around a team that has great a great team culture, you can kind of sense in the air that they've got a great atmosphere. So what we do is we put the top three to five values within that cloud um, and then radiating out from that are the specific behaviors. Um, so we always start these statements with, we work best together when. And we end the statement with a very specific behavior. Um, so for example, um, if your value is something like honesty, a behavior may be that we work best together when we give open feedback to others. Um, respect, again, you would have to decide on what does respect look, for you, look like for your team in terms of actual behavior. It might be something like, we work best together when we greet each other by name in the morning. 
um, do you look each other in the eye? Is that a form of respect or is it the opposite? You know, so what are those specific behaviors? So if you're running this um, in a physical setting, we'd suggest that you actually split up into smaller um, either pairs or threes to write these statements and then come back together and decide on kind of the final statements, get rid of any duplicates um, and just kind of agree that you're comfortable with those as behaviors. Um, if you're working virtually, if you have the option to have smaller breakout rooms, then we definitely recommend that. If not, then you can have a team conversation and just start drafting these statements. Um, just remember the 80-20 rule because this can take quite a lot of time if you're being very pedantic about the specific kind of wording. So um, get to a point where you have a statement and the team is 80% happy um, that, that that kind of portrays the behaviors that you want. And then this becomes a living document. So you can use this again in retrospectives to kind of assess, are we living these behaviors? Are they still relevant? Are there gaps in behaviors that, um, that we'd like to see? Okay. Great. So we've got three sections left in the canvas and they tend to be a little bit more practical in a way than the others that are very focused on kind of collaboration within a team and being, you know, kind of really direct in the behavior that we're expecting. So what we've done is we've got our common and personal goals. We do do two separate activities, but we're going to introduce the concept to you in a very similar way. So uh, common goals are really how um, what are the goals that the team is actually trying to achieve? They're really important because it's usually how people outside of the team measure the success of the team. Okay, so goals tend to convert quite well into metrics. That is at least something that other people outside of the organization can work with us or, or outside of the team and the broader organization can work with us on. Personal goals are individual goals, right? And again, just like needs, it's really important for us to be very clear with people about what our goals are. Right. So we've got a technique for personal goals. Um, it's available. We're going to post the links to all of our different websites shortly. Um, and basically, oh, before I jump in there, that's just how you should have jumped in and reminded me I was going too fast. So all of our techniques are based on uh, the concept of smart goals. Right. So um, smart is something that has been around for years. Uh, but we find uh, people kind of disregard the, you know, the, the great concepts that were kind of created years ago because they feel too traditional and they're not relevant to anymore. But this kind of way of thinking about goals is still very, very relevant. Okay. So just so we're on the same page, just quickly go through this concept of SMART. Um, and, and basically, our personal and our common goals are based on this consistent definition of SMART. So the S essentially stands for specific. Um, this is actually what do we want to achieve, right? So it's usually uh, what we're talking about under specific is our, our, you know, those typical W questions, why, what, when, where, and then your how, okay? So we want to be very, very specific about what is it that we're trying to do. The second that there's too much vagueness, you know, that's when we get confused um, and, and we start kind of seeing high, le high levels of conflict within our team. Um, M is measurable. So when will we meet the goal? But to know that, we have to have a very good sense of where we're coming from, right? So in order for us to measure any kind of goal, we have to have some kind of data at the beginning that we're going to compare to. Okay, so we've got a goal, but where did we actually start from? Um, a is achievable. Uh, I prefer the word feasible, but it would make this a very strange ac acronym if it was an F or be like smurfed or something like that. Like it wouldn't be as cool and as easy to roll off the tongue as smart, right? So achievable or feasible. And the reason why I like to have it as being feasible um, is if we are converting our goals into metrics and it's a way that the success of the team is actually going to be measured by the rest of the organization needs to be feasible, right? Otherwise, we land up with these things that are just too big, right? Like they're too, they're too out of our reach. And it's great to be motivated to achieve something, but it's really important that as a team, we have something um, that we can kind of drive towards that we think that we can actually get to, right? The R is relevant. So is the goal worthwhile? Is this something, um, you know, that that's taking us closer towards our strategy? Um, is it taking us away from our strategy? Because sometimes we have um, 
goals within a team or goals for a product that aren't actually taking us in line with the organization. They're taking us on a different path. So we need to always check back. Is it a worthwhile goal? Is it actually taking us closer to our strategy? And then time bound. So how long is this going to take? Um, and we don't want other people to tell us how long it's going to take. Obviously, from an agile team perspective, we want to be very clear about when we think we're going to be able to do something. So that time criteria, we don't want other people to determine. We want to determine it as a team. Um, and we might actually identify, you know, that we we want to achieve something in the next two weeks, in the next month, in the next three months. We don't want it to go too far into the future, um, you know, like a five-year plan that's going to be far too long for us as a team. Okay, so that's the basics of SMART. That's what the next two techniques are pretty much based on. But we took this concept one step further, right? So we don't just want SMART goals. We want smarter goals, right? So the ER on the end we've added. And essentially, it's allowing us the opportunity to evaluate how we are doing. Okay, again, very often we'll set a strategy at the beginning of the year and we'll have these high level goals for the organization and the teams expected to kind of deliver towards those goals. But we need to have an opportunity to frequently inspect and adapt and kind of evaluate how are we doing against our initial goal. So we like to come back um, every couple of weeks, every couple of months to just really evaluate and see how we're doing. Um, the R essentially stands for... Um, Talia, is the screen showing? I don't know if it's just happening on my side. So it's really about rethinking or redoing. Okay, so how do we redo? How do we reset our goal? Um, and again, this is giving us the opportunity to change things if they need to change. I mean, if we think about any of the goals that we might have set, uh, you know, at New Year, you know, uh, you know, when everybody sends that sets their New Year's resolutions, the goals that we set at the beginning of this year would have to have changed, right? It's been a really unusual year for most people. So we want the opportunity to rethink. Maybe if our goal doesn't quite make sense anymore, more now that we've started working on it. Um, and the two techniques that we've created from a personal goal perspective is something called a smarter canvas. Okay, and this one is available again um, in the booklet. You'll have links to everything. Um, and this is just really a way for a person to go through and articulate what their goals are. Um, and this could be something like, I want to be, a, you know, I want to become an agile coach. And that could, that's a very high level kind of like beauty queen statement. It doesn't help the team understand how you're going to get there. So what you can do is you can actually unpack every, all these questions around specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And you can actually articulate a much better goal statement, personal goal statement that you can share with the team. And you can give them some insight into how am I actually going to achieve this goal? You know, am I going to, you know, maybe attend something like an agile coaching certification? Uh, do I want to do some one-on-one um, -on -one coaching with people in the team? Is anybody willing, you know, to be, uh, you know, one of my one of my initial clients that I can actually start practicing coaching techniques on? Um, so our Smarter Goals Canvas really just gives people an opportunity to share with the team the thinking around their goal. Um, what we do from a team perspective is we play a game. This one is lots and lots of fun. Um, we haven't quite converted this one into a virtual format yet. Card games, um, there are some that translate so easily into a virtual format. This one's taken us a little bit more time to get our head around. Um, and again, it's a game that you can play with your team. It's available to download all the cards and the questions. Um, and essentially what we do is we take those big beauty queen statements that the organization usually gives us, like we want to achieve world peace, right? We give these like super vague goals. And as a team, we actually unpack it into something that we believe we can actually deliver on, something that's a little bit more measurable. Okay. And that brings us to the last section of the canvas. Um, and this is called rules and activities. Um, and it's basically, how do we communicate and keep everyone up to date? So um, this is actually the section that most Scrum Masters are quite comfortable with. And we often call it uh, a working agreement. So this is often what teams do uh, when they're first doing kind of, when they first start a new team. Um, and it speaks very much to the ground rules um, the tools for collaboration, the core working hours, and those kind of things. Um, so what Angie and I like for this section is Adam Weisbot's Scrum Kickoff Planner. So you can download it um, online, and essentially it's a document that you can work through, and it has different sections for the team to fill out. 
And these cover things like, um, obviously at a very high level, kind of your team name, uh, what you're gonna call your team. Um, and then things like methods of collaboration, are you going to use Slack or Zoom or what are the tools that you're gonna to use to collaborate? Um, how do you visualize work? So is it physical or virtual? Um, I think a lot of us have been forced into <laughs> the virtual format now, um, which is not always a bad thing, but uh, essentially it's the agreement for the team with you know, where does the work sit and how do you visualize it? Um, it covers things like core working hours. So I know in South Africa, we've got quite a multicultural and uh, lots of religions um, within our team. So we, it's always something that we have to discuss up front. Um, so for example, don't set meetings really late on a Friday evening, um, A, because it's just not a nice thing to do, um, and B, because also with our Jewish colleagues, they may have to get home for, for Shabbat. So things like that to just be aware of uh, your team members um, and certain kind of religious considerations that may affect their working hours. Uh, things like flexi hours, um, you know, if it's something that's allowed in your organization to actually agree on what those hours are. Um, multiple time zones, which is becoming more and more um, important to to kind of be aware of where people are sitting, especially if you're working remotely, and um, and make sure that no one has to wake up at, at three in the morning. Um, Angie and I, we started the session quite early in South Africa, but it was our choice. So we started at 6.30 in the morning. Um, it was 10 o'clock your time. But it's things like that, you know, just to make sure that, um, that you're not inconveniencing people and that people can kind of attend your team sessions. Um, leave, so if someone's on sick leave, what is your buddy system to make sure that they can uh, catch up on work quickly and easily? Um, your team framework, so that's obviously also a fundamental that you need to decide on. Um, you know, what framework are you going to use? Are you using Scrum? Are you using Kanban? Um, and what, you know, how is that going to work for your team? Things like definition of ready, definition of done, um, team calendar, so if you are doing something like Scrum, when are your Scrum events happening? Um, and just deciding on that calendar um, up front so it suits everyone. Um, and then lastly, things like your conflict protocol. So um, we know that conflict um, can happen within teams um, and it's not always a bad thing. It's actually quite good to have a, a healthy level of conflict, but you want to kind of agree up front how you as a team are gonna handle that. So are you gonna have something like a safe word where if someone kind of says a safe word, you have a, a certain protocol that you agree on. You know, we walk away for 10 minutes, we have a breather, and then we come back and, and discuss what we need to discuss. Um, so this is very much kind of your, your foundation um, rules. So you'll notice that this is something that's often covered in your working agreement, um, but why Angie and I like this team canvas is that it encompasses so much more than just your ground rules. Um, so all the other sections that we've covered cover a lot more to do with the interpersonal interactions with teams, the values, the purpose, the skills, the needs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's a lot, right? We've just gone through <laughs> a lot of different techniques, a lot of theory. Um, the reality is we take two days to lift off a team. We don't necessarily work our way through every single uh, kind of all of those nine different segments. We usually identify what's the most important for the team and we jump into that. But like I said, we usually spend two days working on this. So um, we don't have two days for you to practice everything, but we do want to give you the opportunity to at least practice some of the techniques. So we identified uh, four techniques that work quite well uh, in a virtual in a virtual environment. So that uh, purpose elevator pitch storyboard, uh, the all you need is game, so the needs one, the values exercise that we went through and the strengths and assets, weaknesses and skills, skills pizza one. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna post a link to a Google folder 
um, into the chat. And we're going to ask you to go into the breakout rooms. And I'm going to try and explain where you've got to go to find these breakout rooms because we can't just assign you to them. And what we'll do is we will jump in and help you out with the exercises. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to agree as a team which activity you're going to focus on first. And you're only going to have about 15 minutes or so to practice it. The intention isn't to actually finish the exercise, it's just to get a little bit of practice playing it with a team. Um, for some of the exercises, you'll need to do a super quick case study. For this one, you need to time yourself. It needs to take you under a minute, right? And it's just to help you focus, um, you know, if there's any conversations that might happen about what kind of team are we, what are we building, the case study just helps you out a bit with that. So um, you'll see there's a little dot voting exercise. You'll put your name against a color, and then you'll have some dots corresponding to that color, and you're going to vote using, um, using your dots. Like I said, it's on three of the different uh, case uh, the, the different exercises. The only one that we don't have this case study for is the needs one because that's a personal reflection. Um, okay, there you go. So, so those of you that are still in the main room with us, um, this is pretty much what that Google folder looks like, um, and we'll give you just a quick sense of uh, what those different exercises look like. Okay, so the, there's just a title slide reminding you which activity you went into. Wait for it to load. Here we go. Um, this particular one doesn't have the case study. So what we've got is we've just got a sheet on all of them with some virtual instructions. Um, and the virtual instructions really just talk you through how to do it from a virtual perspective. Like we said, the workbook that's also in that folder um, has more of the in-person um, explanation. So um, essentially, we've also got uh, on slide three, we've got an example of how we do this. This is where you really sort and order your cards and you put them in order of priority for you as an individual, and then you complete the needs cards. And then the next two slides, the idea is that you just kind of copy and paste them for each person in your team, and you give yourself your name. So um, under that name 1.1, it's just indicating that there's more than one slide. Um, you can put my name. And then what we would do is we'd actually drag and drop our top five cards um, on that slide. So there's my two slides for me. Um, and you can see we're just kind of drag and drop those um, in order of priority. Um, so Talia can randomly click some. <laughs> I know creativity probably should be number one for you, but. That's fine. Just gives you an idea. Me. Yeah. And then what you do is you take your top, your top uh, need and you then go to the, the next slide and you would um, kind of put the need under um, the the need section there. So I think it was play on the other one. Um, Might even say something like have fun or, you know. Have fun so. or be playful. Um, yeah. So I request on the team and then you'd give the specific request in there. And then if other teams have, uh, any other team members have some questions, they could type a question on that post-it note and they could, um, I'll actually go in there as well, Talia, and we can collaborate on the same yeah. thing as you're going. Um, and these you would just duplicate then for other people. So mm -hmm. if you've got more than one person, then here this one might be Talia. And you can just duplicate, um, you'll need two slides per person. And depending on how many people you have in your team, you can just duplicate it. Okay, so there's an example. Um, and I added, if you go to slide five, I just added a little question there for Talia. So that's kind of what the all you need uh, one looks like. We'll quickly take you through the others because we do want to start wrapping up in about five minutes or so. So we'll take you through a super high level rundown of how the other technique works, just in case you haven't been able to join a breakout room. Um, so this one uh, is all about purpose. Uh, what we did with this one, it's a very similar exercise to what you saw. We've just got that case study. And that, the case study is only there for this type of conference setup. You don't need the case study for your teams because you'd already be working on a product. Um, so essentially how this one works is, again, we've given you, um, you know, just a way to do the dot voting if you're in the breakout rooms. 
Um, and then you'd be able to vote on your case study. Uh, let me hop in there. You can feel free to jump into those folders anytime you want to, to go play around. There's also a download folder where you can download all of the templates uh, to your local Google Drive. Uh, and the books, it's also in there. This is pretty much, we don't have to go through the case study if you're not going to be doing this in breakout rooms. So we'll just take you through the actual technique itself. Um, so there's our virtual instructions, just talking you through, just in case you need a bit of a reminder about what the different exercises are. Um, and then we've given you that Airbnb example on slide five. So that's there just to remind you kind of what it all needs to look like. Um, and then the actual template itself, what we've done is we've created some icons. So we just added in five slides of icons with different images, um, you know, different, but you can pretty much grab whatever you want off the internet, right? You could add any kind of image in there. Um, these were just to at least have a little bit of a starter, a starter pack of some images that you could use um, in your elevator pitch. And then the idea is, you know, where you need to actually type something. There's just little uh, kind of text fields that you can go in and add some stuff in there. So um, this looks like a guy who's getting some hair lotion, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is pretty much how this one works. There's little boxes for you to type your text, and then you just drag and drop some images into uh, the purpose statement. Um, I think let's quickly jump into the other two and do a super quick intro into how they work. Sorry. Let me get back into your 10. Okay, so we've done needs. We've done purpose. So let's do skills. And this will give you an idea. So the actual pizza is still there. And then every person within the team, uh, this is that one where we're building up our pizza. Um, you know, they each have their own avatar. So we've given um, some space on slide five for people to brainstorm their skills. You just group like skills together, identify the top ones. So maybe by doing some kind of dot voting if you wanted to. And you'd bring those top skills um, into the blank template. So again, we've given you an example of um, a template and what it looks like. Um, and then on uh, slide seven, you'd be able to play around uh, with the avatars, set people's names and start kind of bringing them in. Um, so Talia's brought in one of the skills. You could then rename it and then you'd be the whatever avatar uh, you've identified. Um, so that looks like Talia is going to be the tomato. There's our egg bird again with the egg. Um, if you haven't picked up mine and Talia's humor, we're a little bit on the cheesy <laughs> side. Okay, so this one would just kind of drag and drop your icons and then kind of kick off the conversation. So this one works very similar to the in-person one, um, actually. It's quite similar. Mm. Um, and then the final template that we'll very quickly take you through is um, the one for uh, values. Uh, this one's a great one uh, from a virtual perspective as well. Um, also, we try to keep the look and feel quite similar to the in-person one with the values kind of uh, cloud or that the team atmosphere. Um, so we just created that little, uh, you know, there's your example and then there's a little grid to go and select your values. And you can see there's little dots on the far left that people can drag and drop. Um, so we, we try to kind of create all of the elements that people need for mm. the exercise. Um, the name color coding for dots is here, but I suppose it doesn't really matter too much yeah. as long as you need to pick a color. And then, and then you have five votes. Yeah. You yeah. have five colors and you can, you know, you can spend your votes however you want to. And then what we'd land up with at the end is an idea of what are the top three to five values for the team. We'd bring that into that final slide um, on slide seven. Okay. Okay, so we're getting the signal that we think everybody is back in the main room. So unfortunately, we know not everybody got an opportunity to go into those breakout rooms. Um, but you do still have an opportunity to go and play around with them um, throughout the conference. So just hang on to that link um, and you can go and you can actually download the fresh templates. Um, Talia will show you on that um, on that link where you can go. So if you go under download templates, you can download all four of those virtual ones. 
And there's something else in there. There's a little PDF book. So that book is essentially it's uh, you can print it out and have it next to you, or you can just keep it in PDF. And it basically details all of the steps for all of the exercises that we've been through today. Um, and we will also share a link for um, a website where you can download all of the templates, right? So all of the templates that we've created, we've got downloadable packs that you can come onto our website. Um, and I will get that link very quickly in there into chat so if you when you've got a chance you can visit this website uh, dink is actually an afrikaans word it's dunk it means think um which is why it's it's uh so the actual website is dink.africa um and what you can do is you can go into that website download all of the templates that we've been through today if you want to do physical in-person ones uh for the moment you've got the google uh the google drive where we've got all of the virtual templates, they're going to be added to the website uh, sometime this week as well. Um, but yeah, and there's a lot more techniques in there that you're welcome to go through. So we've just got some for our sprint off workshop there. Uh, you can see there's everything else. Um, you just go in and you kind of download the pack. So you don't have to recreate these from scratch. You're welcome to use what we've got. Um, and then just a reminder really about what our inspiration was. So we kicked off this initial session talking about this team canvas and how um, this canvas kind of articulated all of the stuff that we were doing with teams in one in one place, right? So those nine different segments, we highly encourage you to go have a look at their website. We wish we had been smart enough to create that canvas ourselves. <laughs> um, we just kind of created some techniques uh, we like to gamify a lot of our sessions. Like we said, our team liftoffs using that team campus tend to take us about two days. Uh, so we do recommend spending the required time with your teams. Um, mm. If you don't get through all of the techniques in the liftoff, what we often do is we'll actually bring it in as a retrospective technique. So yeah. um, if we haven't had an opportunity to do everything, you know, with everybody, um, we'll... Um, you know, we'll, we'll actually bring it in as part of the retrospective. So things like that, all you need is game. That's really good for a retrospective exercise, mm. especially if the team's, you know, battling, you know, maybe there's been a little bit of conflict because there's been differing types of needs. So um, I do know that there were two questions um, in the Q&A and, and one of them was actually around the needs. It says, what if two team members have opposite needs or expectations from the team? So if we have a look at that, all you need is game. Um, what we want to do is we want to just really have that transparent conversation, right? So, and that's an opportunity for us to uncover that there could be competing needs in a team. Mm. Um, to be honest, I haven't actually seen competing needs. I've just usually seen when needs aren't skillfully explained to other people. That's usually what we see. Mm. Um, you know, everybody wants to create a great environment to work. None of us want to, you know, hate the environment that, you know, we go into work with every day. So most people are very open to uh, kind of modifying their behavior if it means it's creating a great space for other people. So we don't see totally competing teams where we can't work in the same space together. Usually what we see is just people haven't skillfully explained what they need from a team to really feel happy and confident. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers um, the question. So, something to add maybe there's... to that, Angie, as well, is that exercise that we did with the um, the smart goals, the personal goals. So what we see sometimes as well is almost hidden agendas. So um, needs are important, but also being clear and open about your goals. You know, so if there's a personal goal that you're striving for and the team's not aware of it, often it comes across as like underhanded and like a hidden agenda. Whereas if you're able to articulate like, this is my goal. I want to become an agile coach. And in order to get there, these are the things, this is the type of experience. These are the things I want to do. Often if you're able to articulate that properly, the team will actually support you. So I think it, a lot of it's about just getting things out in the open and having an open and honest conversation. Um, you know, if the team, if there really is such a clash, often you find people almost self-eject. Um, you know, similar to our skills discussion, you know, if someone's doing something that they don't enjoy um, all the time, you know, they would often self-eject. They would leave the team. They would say, well, you know, I'm not enjoying this. I'm not aligned or whatever. But often we find if you're able to express it and articulate it to the team, uh, more often than not, the team would support you. Yeah. And it's all about conversation. You'll see all the yeah. techniques that we've been through. They really do focus on that conversation side. 
Um, so yeah, speak about it, get it out into the open. That's going to be your first step towards getting to that team environment that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another question that was posted. Uh, so sometimes in high performance teams, people tend to become excessively competitive. This can lead to change in the atmosphere or overall health of the team. What would you suggest to tackle such situations? Um, interestingly enough, I would actually possibly suggest that that's not as high performance as we think it is, right? So um, if we go back to our slide and we have a look, um, I think, Tali, if we go forward like two slides, mm -hmm. I think. Um, to the Google, what the Aristotle project identified, um, there is dependability on each other, right? There is psychological safety to be your best, there's meaning there's impact. Um, and one of the characteristics that we don't see there is the self, kind of self-preservation, right? So mm -hmm. when we're in high performance teams, we almost talk about it being a rising platform, right? We're trying to lift everybody in the team up. We're not doing something just for our own benefit. Uh, what we tend to find is that's organizational things that are impacting individual team members in the team. So maybe the way people are being, um, remunerated, maybe the way that your, your bonus or performance appraisals are, mm -hmm. are taking place but they're very individual focused. When we see that, um, creating a high performance team is going to be significantly harder, right? Because with these high performance teams, we're looking for where we can trust people. You know, we spoke about what are those characteristics of high performance teams at the beginning, dependability, accountability. You know, we, we kind of can trust each other. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I would kind of say, I, I think that uh, high performance from the perspective that we're speaking about, we really want it to be a team effort, right? We don't want to have individual heroes um, within the team at the expense of other people, right? Nobody wants to work in an environment like that. And again, it's hard to create that if the organization mm. doesn't really structure um, the kind of team dynamics that we've been talking about today. Mm. I think one, uh, one thing you could try in that situation is to really connect people to things like the purpose and the meaning of um, the team. So what's the, the bigger picture that they're working towards um, and try and almost find like a common goal. So often if you're working towards a common goal, um, you wouldn't want to compete and kind of step on other people, you know. So there are kind of uh, things that you can focus on to try drive a common uh, common purpose and a common goal within a team. Are there any, I think, uh, I think we're pretty much out of time. So I was going to oh. propose... Uh, you know, are there any additional questions? We have answered the two under Q&A. Um, if there are more questions, come and find Talia and I. Um, I. I suppose we can go and hang out in those in the booths or something a little bit later. Um, and like we said, go visit the website, download everything. We really do believe that these techniques have the opportunity to change the environments that we work in, which is why we make them freely available. Um, so feel free to kind of adapt them to your context. And, um, you know, all that we ask for is if you do use one of our techniques, just credit us a little bit, but you're welcome to kind of build on them and change them for your space as you need to. And I suppose the last thing for us to say is good luck applying all of these back in your space. Hopefully the virtual ones work well. Uh, please send us feedback via the website if you would like to see new techniques or if something needs to be changed on the virtual templates. Um, they haven't been used as extensively as the physical ones. But we'd love your feedback. And we just want to say thank you very much for joining us this morning. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of Agile India. And we wish we were in India to actually have yeah. done this in person, but this is a close second. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us.